Hello there and you welcome to CNL Extra on City TV. My name is Philip Nilate. Coming up. President Tekufado condemns recent attacks of violence uh, recorded on the campuses of the University of Ghana and the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Blessing to wake up or to hear that student activities which ought to be normally without violence end up in hope. Police begin investigations into the cause of death of two teenage girls at Okrekojo in the eastern region. Also, minority in parliament reiterates call on the government to expedite work on the construction of the La General Hospital. In uh, March this year, the minority members on the health committee visited this same place and most of you were here with us. And later, the electricity company of Ghana not anticipating any form of objection from the public to the new 27.15% tariff increment. It us negatively, you know, because uh, now the even market is down, market is down. We don't make much as we used to do first. Many thanks for joining us on CNL Extra on City TV. This program is conversational and interactive. You can join us with your thoughts and contributions and comments on 0550585832. And to have the conversation with me is Jude Mesa Duncan. Hi. Hi, Thank Philip. you to have you here. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure. Exactly. So um, let's go straight into the stories. And President Dekufado has condemned acts of violence recorded in the two public universities. And let's watch more in this video. President Takufado has condemned recent acts of violence recorded in the country's two public universities. Now, the president says that violent acts on the campuses of the University of Ghana and the, University, at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, KNUSD, must not be encouraged. City News' Samir Afi has more in the following report. Speaking at a meeting with the leadership of the National Union of Ghana Student Nooks at the Jubilee House, President Akufalu says recent acts of violence among students of the University of Ghana and the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology is not the best. Nanel Kufado says students should engage in dialogue to resolve all issues instead of violence. Now students of the Commonwealth Hall, Mensa Saba Hall of the University of Ghana, engage in a fight leading to the destruction of university properties and private properties as well. Few weeks on, students of the University Hall and Unity Hall of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Kumasi also engage in the fight resulting in the injury of many over a procession. University authorities have subsequently placed the ban on all such processions. President Akufado says such acts should be condemned by all. I'm impressed by the, your determination to, to promote harmony on our campuses because it's, it's distressing to wake up or to hear that student activities which ought to be normally without violence end up in halls fighting each other and destroying properties. I'm not quite sure who benefits from that. I can't see that anybody benefits from that kind of behavior and that the leadership of NOOCS has made it a point to be able to uh, focus on this and try and find a handle to bringing that type of behavior under control. I think it's very commendable on your part. I want to encourage you to continue down that path so that whatever issues that there are, because generally most issues that there are in the society can be addressed by negotiation and dialogue. Yeah. And everybody putting their cards fully on the table. We should be able to find solutions to the problems and not have to resort to violence and the destruction of, uh, of, of public property. Then you destroy properties in the universities, especially the public universities. It's the same taxpayer who's going to come forward and find the means to repair them. 
the president of NUCS, Dennis Apia Labio, on his part, appealed to the president to help nurses and teacher trainees assess their monthly allowances. Your Excellency, there is a big issue at the student front concerning the nursing training allowances you restored. And that is the situation that in the last 10 months, the allowances have not been paid. What it means is that critically, it is damaging the good reputation the government has secured by restoring the nursing training allowance. I believe and pray that the patience of the student front to have held on till now, over 10 months, especially through our office as NOOCs, consistently inviting the nursing training associations to calm down and calm down and calm down and not to go out onto the street. We are praying that that good faith be used in exercising restraint on our student front would be appreciated. And it's refreshing that the president of the Republic of Ghana, at least he has spoken about this particular issue that we've all condemned after it happened at the University of Ghana mm -hmm. campus and also that of KNUST. Mm -hmm. And a number of actions were taken by the management of KNUST. The council came out to um, put in some uh, recommendations or some measures and that came out where they said they are going to ban the JCR system among others. So I think it's a step in the right direction that the president has spoken about this issue. Yeah, I mean, Philip, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a breath of fresh air. Yeah. Let me put it that way. But let me just take you back briefly. Recall in 2019, during mm -hmm. the State of the Nation address, when the president said that he would for instance, he's minded about the next generation and not the next election. Um, it, it gave, was a very powerful thing to say at the time. And to a very large extent, it gave um, people felt that subsequently government's actions and inaction didn't give credence to some of the things, especially low investment in education, um, the, the fierce HS struggles they had to go to due to food shortages. So all of these things, to a large extent, didn't sort of give credence to the president's remarks about being minded about the next generation or the next election. But subsequently, we've seen that he's now concerned about what is happening at the student front. So for me, this is a, is a breath of fresh air. It shows that the president is actually concerned about what is happening at the student level. I mean, it's true was speaking to um, the um, youth, um, yeah, the, the NUCS, the, the National yeah. Union of Guardian Student Leadership. But nonetheless, like I'm saying, it, it shouldn't end there. It shouldn't just be a warning or it shouldn't just be an advice or admonition. It should also be backed with some um, government work in that regard. Like we've been saying all the time, it's very important and imperative that governments take the issue of campus policing yes. on our campuses very seriously. We've been saying that if you look at the this, this, um, um, citizen to police ratio in this country, it's really nothing to write home about. Mm. It's about one police officer to 1,200 citizens. It's probably worse on our campus where we have about, for instance, the University of Ghana community is 45,000, probably seeing at the Kwame Krumah University of Science, Science and Technology. Technology. So it's very important that we take some of these things seriously. And also, I mean, it's, it's imperative that they resource the counseling unit at the Ghana Education Service so they can also be able to make sure that all of these public educational institutions have some high-level counseling system or structure in place to be able to help students who have to deal with some of these things. If you speak to a family that has a relative hospitalized as a result of this clash. They'll tell you that this clash is senseless. Of if you speak to a, a hall tutor who has to miss lectures to make police reports and report at a management level because of these violent clashes, they'll tell you it's a waste of time. So there's nothing pleasant about these clashes. And for me, it's very important that the president has now spoken about this issue. But the president also called for some form of negotiations and dialogue. So I think management of the various institutions have commenced that an investigation into the issue actually. I, I, yes. I'm, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about dialogue for an issue that is quite straightforward and criminal in my opinion. I mean if you go on the streets right now and someone takes a stone because he's provoked and throws or hurls that stone at you. I'm not sure. You see, the only reason why these students, to a large extent, have been protected is because these clashes have happened on campus where there's some sort of um, freedom or a little leeway okay. to be misbehaving in, in that regard. But I'm sure if it happened elsewhere, it would have been treated differently. The person would have been taken on. Exactly. The individuals would have, would have been uh, taken on seriously. Yeah. Yeah. That is why some people have called. Some, I mean, I was listening to a former dean of students at the University of Ghana, um, um, pro, um, Dr. Vladimir Inchina. And he yeah, was so saying, yes. for instance, let's, let's, let's treat it as it is. That's as a criminal case. So when the president says or calls for dialogue, to an extent, I understand where the president is coming from. We need to look at the, the root cause of some of these problems. But at the end of the day, we need to also treat it 
as serious as it is. And for me, it's, a, it's criminal. Some of the people inciting these things are doing that okay. on their own um, initiatives, and we need to care about it. Okay, so it needs to be cared. And um, though the president has spoken about it, we would want that um, some more action should be taken on these um, activities so that it will end. Let's move straight to another story where the University of Ghana and the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, they have been cited um, for running non-accredited programs and also engaging in double salaries. Uh, let's bring you more in this video. The University of Ghana and the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology have been cited for running non-accredited programs while the KNUST has only 61 out of 360 programs being accredited, 373 programs advertised by the University of Ghana have not been accredited. The report further fingered four officers of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology of taking double salaries. The report of the Auditor General on the Public Accounts of Ghana, of public boards, corporations and other statutory institutions for the period ended December 31, 2021, revealed some tertiary institutions having issues with programs that they run. According to the report, the Kwame Nkrumah Investor of Science and Technology out of its 360 programs has only 61 of them been accredited. The Auditor General noted that 117 and 73 of the ones which have not been accredited has since been sent to the National Accreditation Board for accreditation and reaccreditation, respectively, while 109 is yet to be sent to the National Accreditation Board for accreditation. However, out of the 61 programs that have been accredited, the university was unable to provide accreditation certificates for of them. The Auditor General attributed the anomaly to lack of management's proactiveness to ensure that all programs are accredited before running them coupled with untimely renewal of the certificates of the expired accredited programs. The Auditor General therefore recommended to management to cease running programs that are not accredited or having its accredited certificates expired until they are accredited or renewed to avoid sanctions by the National Accreditation Board. The Auditor General further asked management to ensure timely accreditation of any introduced program and prompt renewal of all expired accredited certificates. The Auditor General also uncovered an issue of double salary of 488868 in the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. According to the Auditor General, his review of the payroll records of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology disclosed that management granted sabbatical leave to four officers and subsequently paid them basic and market premium in accordance with the investors' conditions of service. Further checks by the Auditor General, however, revealed that the officers left the university to take up various appointments in other government institutions where they are being paid full monthly salaries, including basic salary and other allowances. The Auditor General notes that this has resulted in double payment of basic salary a market premium by government to officers to the tune of 488,868 Ghana CDs. The four officers include Bayo Marcel, who is an associate professor at the pharmaceutical department. He was granted sabbatical leave from 1st October 2019 to 31st July 2020 to take up appointment as director of the Institute of Traditional and Alternative Medicine at the University of Health and Allied Science Hall also, Solomon Pamford, who is at the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, was granted sabbatical leave from 1st February 2019 to 31st January 2020 to take appointment as Registrar of the Investor of Energy and Natural Resources. Professor Samuel Ni Odai of the Civil Engineering Department was also granted sabbatical leave from 1st July 2019 to 30th June 2020 to take appointment as Vice Chancellor of the Accra Technical University and granted extension to 30th June 2021. Professor Peter Chumesi of the Biochemistry and Biotechnology Department and Associate Professor was granted sabbatical leave from 1st February 2019 to 31st December 2021 to take up appointments as Director General of the National Sports Authority. On the part of the University of Ghana, the Auditor General noted that the University advertised 374 academic programs on the various web portals that had the accreditation expired or requires re-accreditation during the period under review. 
out of these 374 programs, diploma programs take up 14, undergraduate 80, postgraduate 213, PhD 67, all amounting to 374. And this is a very big issue we shouldn't be taking lightly because I can't imagine going um, mm -hmm. to school four years in the university and I come out and a report comes out from the Auditor General's uh, office that the course I offered or pursued is not, not accredited. It's, it's serious and I don't even know. See, the, the Auditor General's report is for me one of the most single, most depressing documents every time. I mean, you go through it, you get the impression that some people have set out to fleece the, the, the state in one way or the other. And it's both ways. People would want to fleece the state or take out on due advantage of the state and also authorities who sometimes, who sometimes allow it as a result of negligence. So it's, it's very unfortunate that we have to come to this point as a country. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad and it, it further worsens the already um, porous state of our education. What I understand is mm. before you take a course or run a program in an institution, mm. you should get accreditation from the appropriate yeah, the authority. Section 36 of the Education Regulatory Act, and let me just read it briefly. It says, a person who runs or advertises a tertiary education program that is not accredit accredited commits an offence and is liable on summary conviction to a fine not less than 10,000 penal penalty units and not more than 20,000 penalty units or a term of imprisonment no less than 15 years and no more than 20 years. And when years. I spoke to the ranking member on the mm. Education Committee mm. on, of Parliament yesterday, mm. Peter Nochikoto, he mm. says that this comes to the door of the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. Yes. And they are supposed to ensure that all these things are done. Yeah. The KNUST management has also come out to say that for them, they don't have any issue with it because they've submitted everything to the Ghana Tertiary Education Committee, GTEC. And if yeah. that is what hasn't happened or they've not been able to um, send the accreditation yeah. through. I mean, there were some administrative lapses, uh, so that you can, you, can, you can admit. But like you're saying, people are paid to be checking some of these things. So when they are not checked, then there's a problem. I mean, when you look at the mandate of the Ghana Tertiary Education Co Commission yeah, that was commission, re yes. recently um, launched, I think, under this current yeah. government. I mean, it's to be looking or playing supervisory roles over some of these things. So it's unfortunate. But I mean, in its in this entirety, really, the Auditor General's report, like I'm saying, mm. it's, it's, it's really a very painful document to go to because of some of the, the contents in it. I mean, I, I was listening to an economist, Dr. Tio Champon, yesterday on the point of view, and he has sort of um, done some analysis of the report. So if you take it for five years and you look at the irregularities at the, at the MMDA level, mm. so it's a total of about 63 billion Ghana cities lost to financial irregularities. Now he's arguing that if you look at the current um, GDP, the total GDP of the country, that's somewhere around 450. 59 billion. If you divide it, that's about 14% of the country's GDP being lost to financial irregularities only from the Auditor General's report. So it's, it's scandalous. This I is mean, very serious and it's scandalous. Not one that's program, not, not two way. program, but over 600 programs in the University of Ghana and also that of KNUSD. I think the various authorities must check it as soon as possible so that individuals who went in for these programs at least don't have their minds at rest. Let's move straight to another story where the motionless bodies of the two teenage girls were found at uh, the on the road of Okra Kojo Junction in the Edukrom Kofuridia stretch on Tuesday dawn and the police has begun investigations into the issue. Let's bring you more in this video. The police in Edukrom have begun investigations into the cause of the death of two teenage girls at Okra Kojo, a community in the Krapim North municipality of the eastern region. The lifeless bodies of the two teenage girls were found along the shoulders of the road at the Okra Kwajo junction on the Adukrom Koforidia stretch on Tuesday dawn after the two allegedly left their homes to visit their boyfriends a night before. City News' Neon Ni Amati Kanaku, who visited the families of the two teenage girls, reports that the family wants justice to be served. When City News got to the family house of the teenagers, a gathering was there to commiserate with them over the passing of the two 16-year-olds who were in junior high school at the Okra Koju LA. It is unclear what caused their death, 
but the two who had sustained head injuries when their motionless bodies were found at the Okra Koju Junction were rushed to the Tetekwasi Memorial Hospital in Ekuyapumampong and the Eastern Regional Hospital in Kufuridia, respectively, where they were shortly pronounced dead on arrival by medical professionals who attended to them. James Ofe is an uncle to one of the diseased teenage girls, and he narrates how the family heard the news. Meanwhile, the families of both teenage girls who are awaiting autopsy reports say they suspect foul play, attributing their claims to text messages seen on the phone of one of the victims retrieved at the scene. The mother and other relatives who spoke to City News wants justice to be served. <laughs> Family saying sometimes it's right, sometimes it's not right. Because when you say accident, we didn't see the car or motor. Who showed us that? Is? So, so this means say, you come from phone, you do on the go. When you accident, and and you need motor, and you need car, and I press for the bank, so you call on someone. You will be a can you try you ten. I will hire a police for your investigation. Until you never say you're going to need to hold on to one of you, when you're not for the assemblyman for the area, this issue has taken the community by storm. Michael Gadasu is the assemblyman for Krakoju electoral area. You know, in this electoral area, uh, I think the Okri, the whole Okri constituency, we don't really have challenge like that. The security are always on check, but this one, this one is something that is baffling everyone because incident of that such have never, never happened in this. Uh, area, you know, we have situation whereby this person is strong, you know, maybe uh, the person something happy they go to the bush, these hunters, yes, that one we know, but for kids at that age, you know, it has never happened. It has never happened. The securities are very good, you know, they they make sure that. But this one is that's why the security, the whole system, the commander. Everybody is trying to, you know, go through so that next time, next time, search is there will not. And this is very sad. And the community members are asking for um, security to be beefed up or intensified in the community. But I think that in as much as the security officers can't do their bit, security also falls into our domain as individuals. Parenting is very important. This same issue happening somewhere at Ablikwan Mahian or Joman where a uh, 16 years or 14 year old girl in their teens uh, was killed and was dammed into a drain. This is happening at Okra Kujo in the eastern region. Mm -hmm. And for how long will this continue going? I think parenting is very important and the parents must also take it upon themselves to ensure that, but in, in, in any way, why would you say that you are going to visit your boyfriend at that time? Uh, that's, that's not even, that's uh, slightly material to the, the point. For me, I, I think that for a country that has not completely healed from the Takrade kidnap mm. incident, and of course the Abyssin murdering uh, murder incident that um, happened not too long ago, this is very sad that it has happened. It's, it's very unfortunate, and for me, sad. I mean, a lot of the time when some of these scandals or murder incidents that shake the country happen, what happens is that we take a lot of um, rushed decisions from the police service security agencies but those decisions that are taken are sort of localized exactly. so it's just for that particular area security will be intensified for a couple of days probably months then that's just about it we forget that it's really about the national covering so I, I, it's sad that it has happened but we expect that security will be intensified, investigations will be followed through to ensure that the logical conclusion is brought to the matter perpetrators are made to face the they law. Are to um, yes, but I mean, 
there's only as, as much as you can do as a parent in some of these instances. And so, I, I mean, of course, parenting is very important. You can't discount that. But then again, the, the bigger conversation is about how our security officers we may, are I'm, able I'm, to... I'm not cutting you, mm. but the security officers, when this issue also happened at Ablekuma, mm. the uh, residents there are asking for security to be intensified. The security officers will come there, like you indicated, it's going to be a month, two, three, and that is it. We will not see them again. But when we, the individuals, take security into our hands and you know that mm. this is where I'm going to this evening and it's not appropriate for me to even go out, mm. why, why go out? It's, it's, it's imperative that you take security into your own hands. I mean, that, that is a no-brainer at all. Exactly. But there are certain instances that you can't prevent. You not say because you are scared to go out in the evening. You not go out at all. I mean, there will be certain emergencies. I mean, something will happen that you definitely need to uh, a little change or alter your daily routine a little bit. So that is a given. But the point I'm saying is that it, it, the greater responsibility lies on our duty bearers. It lies on our, 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 the policy makers. Um, security policy makers, the interior ministry, government, okay. to ensure that um, they take into um, greater consideration the entire security of the country. I mean, it's been let's lose for some time exactly. now, if you have been so, so, so that is it. So it's, the it's security important. in that particular community must be intensified, and that is what actually the assembly member for that community, the Okre Kojo uh, community, asked for. This is still CNR Extra on City TV. Still to come. Minority in Parliament reiterates call on the government to expedite work on the reconstruction of the La General Hospital. Stay with us, we'll be back with more. Many thanks for staying with us. This is still CNR Extra on CTTV. You can join us with your thoughts contributions and comments on 0550585832. Let's bring you some more stories. And uh, the minority in Parliament wants work on the reconstruction of the La General Hospital expedited two years after it was demolished. Let's bring you more in this video. The minority in Parliament has reiterated its call on the government to expedite work on the reconstruction of the La General Hospital. The health facility was demolished in March 2020 for redevelopment due to the dilapidated nature of the structures. Now, two years on, work is yet to commence on the site despite several assurances from the government. During a visit to the site, the ranking member on the Health Committee of Parliament, Kobna Minta Kando, assured of the minority's resolve to have the health centre completed. Ni Ayikoyeno Kain has more in this report. The La General Hospital was pulled down in March 2020 for redevelopment due to the deplorable nature of the structures. The facility witnessed a sword cutting ceremony by President Ekufuado at a grand deborah of chiefs and government officials. Subsequent to this, not much of work is ongoing at the site, despite several assurances from the government to complete the project. Many residents of La and the minority in parliament have criticized the delay in the construction of the health facility and bemoaned the difficulty in accessing quality health care in the community. The minority, during a visit to the site in March 2022, accused the government of misapplying the 68 million euro funds allocated for the project, hence its inability to complete the work on schedule. On Wednesday, when the minority once again visited the site, it was observed that the heavy-duty machines undertaking the project had been grounded with workers parking some of the materials out of sight. Sections of the site had also been used as farmlands by some persons. Heap of sand could be seen at other parts of the site. The minority, led by the ranking member on the Health Committee of Parliament, Kwabna Minta Kando, reiterated the group's resolve to ensure the speedy completion of the facility. Somewhere in uh, March this year, the minority members on the Health Committee visited this same place and most of you were here with us. There hasn't been much improvement. The only difference I have seen is that they've grown some okra on the field, quite apart from that. In fact, as at the time we came here, we saw about two trips of sand, and that's all we are seeing at the moment. So we came here calling on government to expedite action on their project in order for the minister to create the impression that we are lying and that a lot of things were ongoing at the site. We came here on the 11th of March this year. The minister himself 
came in, in, in a convoy style to this particular venue and said that, yes, they had, I mean, signed another agreement and that they were going to expedite action and that the project that was supposed to complete in 24 months, now they were going to complete it in 30 months. This month is the 29th month. Is the 29th month. And look at what is going on here. Absolutely nothing. What is even hurting is that immediately we entered here, we saw them packing, I mean, things, materials on the site and moving away and leaving us here. So it's about time the president himself and his minister are candid to the people of this area. They are not being treated fairly at all. Where are they assessing healthcare? Where? If they had left the old structure, at least you could have been responding to their health needs. So making the news is not our target, as I indicate to you all the time. If we have to come here hundred times, we will come here. Getting the job done is our target. And we'll continue to come here until this contract or this project is fully executed. Much as governments assured that the reconstruction of the large general hospital has started, uh, the pace at which the work is ongoing is very slow. Hence, the call by the minority for the government to ensure speedy completion of the project. Reporting from La in Accra, my name is Ni Ayukwe Okain for City News. So after demolishing the infrastructure, one would have thought that by now we would get to a, a height that individuals will know that at least some form of work is going on there. For 29 months, nothing has been done about this project. The La General Hospital serves communities such as Teshi, Nungwa, Osu, and La community itself. And if individuals within these communities are to access health care, that means they have to move all the way from La Teshinungwa and come to maybe Kolebu or the Greater Accra Regional Hospital Ridge or go to Tema General Hospital. And even the La Township, there is a makeshift, I'll put it that way, hospital there, that polyclinic that is not even serving the purpose. The MP for the area, for the... Uh, Rita Naudoli. Exactly. She's complained several times, but nothing has been done about this. I quite recall in March, early this year, March 4, 2022, that's this year, um, the same team, a minority com the, the committee on health, health yes. but the minority side of it, so um, Mita yeah, Kando Mita led Kando, yes. uh, some journalists and other members of the minority to go to the same site. And after going there, granting a press release, they accused the government of misapplying some 68 million euro grant um, given purposely for the said construction of the hospital. A day later, the presidential advisor on health um, Dr. Nsiasai came out strongly, quite heavy. He was saying that it wasn't true and that the contractors would begin work the following week. Up until now, nothing has happened. The president is even on record to have said that completion of the hospital would have been this month, August, no, sorry, that's last month. Yes, last Today's month. 1st September, August 2022. And up until now, nothing has happened. Just a heap of sand and some gravels lying on the construction ground like that. It's, 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 it's unfair. And I, I, I watched the deputy, former deputy health minister, mm. Dr. Okoboy. Bernardo Koboy, who is now the CEO for the National Health Insurance Authority. He says that it looks like the health ministry and the finance ministry is in forthcoming with information. Because if you don't have if you yeah. have good information about this project, if you are saying that it's going to be completed within 30 months mm. and we are in the 29th month, mm. nothing has happened on the project, then what are you telling us? When, when, when are you looking at its and, uh, completion? And coming from Okoboy, you know that this is a probably serious matter because at that time he was the deputy health minister exactly. and he would have had a lot more information on some of these things. See, if you look at the La General Hospital, it complements the Greater Accra Regional Hospital to some extent, also Kolebu. But these hospitals now are already overburdened with patients. The president, when he was commissioning or um, cutting sword for the construction of the hospital in a speech, mentioned that the hospital saw a 30% increase in maternal health um, conditions and other pregnancy-related um, um, conditions. And for me now, I'm struggling to imagine where all of these people would go, would go to yes. in case of an emergency. So it's very unfair that we subject people in that area, residents within Lateshi, Nungwa, like you said, to this kind of ordeal. 
one would have thought that if government at the time of demolishing the hospital was not prepared, the easy approach was to probably reduce the status of the hospital mm. to a polyclinic, polyclinic and begin a face-by-face -face renovation or upgrade of the hospital. But to boldly go all out and demolish, demolish. it, you should have a plan to make sure that it's really fixed or, or built back quickly. So it's, it's unfair. And, and for me, if the president is concerned about the, the well-being and the livelihoods and the health Healthcare of, of, of his citizens, he should rule. Someone should be made to be answering very serious questions about mm. why people in La and Teshi and its no surrounding Boa communities and don't have, not having don't have the, a, hospital. The, a hospital for themselves. And I think this should be done as soon as possible. If the minority is raising questions with us, community members are also raising questions with us, and that government and, and must Duncan be is also raising questions with questions us. Really okay, so you. let's move to the electricity company of Ghana, and they are charging the public to embrace the increment in utility tariffs. That is happening today. Let's bring you more in this video. The electricity company of Ghana, ECG, says it is not anticipating any form of objection from the public to the new 27.15% tariff increment. The increment announced by the Public Utility Regulatory Commission, PURC, will take effect on Thursday. Speaking to City News ahead of the implementation, the general manager in charge of external communications at the electricity company of Ghana, Charles Ni Aiku Aiku, said... Ghanaians must embrace the new tariff for enhanced service delivery. Meanwhile, operators say they will pass on the cost of their customers. Fred Duhu has more in the following report. The 27% and 22% tariff increment in electricity and water respectively, as announced by the Public Utilities Regulatory Commission, PURC, is expected to take effect from Thursday, September 1, 2022. The Electricity Company of Ghana on its part has indicated his preparedness to implement the increment without delay. This, according to the general manager in charge of external communications at the Electricity Company of Ghana, Charles Ni Aiku Aiku, will be accepted by the public, taking into account customers' appreciation of current economic conditions. I believe that Ghanaians do understand the current situation, the current economic situation, and they also understand the the role government is playing to make sure that our industries will grow so, um, so this is the first time that there's been an increment i mean the last time was 2018 which was even a reduction of a, 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 a significant percentage so if they've been so and this is the first time we've had an increment even an increment where we requested for 148%, we're giving 27.15, and we are still working very hard to make sure that we provide that reliable and quality service. Ghanaians do understand. Meanwhile, some ECG prepaid vendors say they are yet to receive any formal communication from the electricity company of Ghana with regards to the increment. What do you do here? Uh, I sell prepaid to my customers. What kind of prepaid? Uh, no way than ECG3. Good. Now, we understand there is some tariff adjustment um, that will take effect from tomorrow, 1st September. Uh, did you receive that information? Yeah, yeah, me too. I've heard about that, but I've not received any message from the main office there. My boss always go there for any information. Then they will talk to him about it. Then my boss too, will also report to me back. For what I know now is when you buy 20 cities, you get 20 cities back. But sometimes they take ch charges from it, which is a uh, service charge, which is 7 cities, 0.43 per suite. For those who, who are uh, like using the house meters, room, and for the shop ones too, they take 12 cities, 0.43 per suite. For service charge, for every month. The customers come here to complain about the fact that they bought prepaid, and within a short period of time, it, it is finished, and they feel it, it is from your end. Yeah, a lot, a lot. Some even try to even fight with us, argue with us, because they think we are the one who has been stealing from them. By me, it's not us. How are you proceeding tomorrow? So we are waiting for them to tell us something for tomorrow, please. So you go to the main office to buy the quota, and we buy 2,000, and the interest on it is, uh, I think, 45 cities or something. Uh, so you buy, you sell, and... 
you go back to buy another one to uh, come and sell again. Yeah. Let's speak to some business owners who rely heavily on electricity for their operations. And here I am at an um, internet cafe. And so far, we realize there are a number of computers here. People who are browsing. They have a printer that they use, photocopier and everything. But let's engage the manager here. Let me say we use um, 100 CDs for, I think, a week. A week. Every week we buy 100 CDs. That is sometimes it goes higher. That's if we don't, if we, if we are using the AC regularly, it goes higher. But if we're not using the AC, like this time, the what do you call it? The weather is very cool, so we don't normally use the AC, so it's quite down now. Yeah. Now, we understand there is tariff increment that is going to take effect from tomorrow. How is that going to impact your business going forward? Hmm, actually. Even currently, we we really suffering, you know, the increments of um, materials we use for work, and then the internet service and everything, and then the light too is going to go up, and then uh, you know, in at the end, it's definitely going to affect us negatively, you know, because of course we have no option than to embrace the new rate, and in this economic challenging moments. We are having 27.15% increase in electricity tariffs. Well, they have been asking for 148%, but they ended up getting 27.15%. So henceforth, if you are going to buy electricity, you should know that 27.15% uh, is on it, or uh, <laughs> you have to go through it. <laughs> I mean, you see, nobody likes to pay taxes, and, and nobody likes to pay utility bills, but, I mean, that is how you build countries. Mm. Everybody contributes, and everybody paying something small. That is how countries are built. I mean, if you look at the increments in itself, to be very honest with you, and from a very realistic point of view, it's, it's fair, because the only time they increased um tariffs has been somewhere 2018 and that was the only time there was an adjustment for some people it was even lower some had to pay more if you look at this particular increment even for lifeline consumers mm. they've been given some sort of um support or help in that regard what is not too clear is the demarcations and the the specification or the categorizations of the various consumers because when you say for instance that we are so, sort of giving a different package to barbering saloon users um store operators um uh, barbering shops and all of those small roadside shops that operate I mean, what was the package for also people who run businesses from their homes, startups that run their businesses from their homes, you see? So the classification didn't go down too well. But the only reason, really, why I see a lot of people not too enthused about, about this, this is, has got to do with the current economic conditions or climate in the country. I mean, it's a very difficult time. Look at the city depreciation, for instance. Look at where inflation is surging towards. So it's very difficult amidst all that is happening within the economy when you want to demand more monies from the pockets of Ghanaians. But I believe if things had stabilized a bit, I don't think people would have had cause to complain about this at all. So for me, the two issues really has got to do with its timing. Mm -hmm. But like I'm saying, the alternative to the increment would have been far more disastrous because Damn. then businesses would have to close down because they could only be electricity to used for their, their businesses. Can you imagine all these cold store operators, people who heavily depend on electricity? They, so they depend heavily on the, electricity. The alternative would have been far more disastrous. Mm. But that's being said, the timing too didn't help things. But those two aside, I'm think, I, I think at least, I mean, sometimes we should also try and consider governments more and, and, so and help they, there. For, from you, the they, timing is not right, but we have no option than to embrace it. Thank you. And we will pay. Okay, we will pay. <laughs> let's, let's move straight to another story where the Food and Drugs Authority in the Western region has commenced a full probe into another case of alleged food poisoning at a popular Wache, Wache Jointo in Takrade. Let's bring you more in this video. The Food and Drugs Authority office in the Western region has begun investigations into a case of alleged food poisoning at a popular Wache Joint in Takrade. This follows complaints from our for residents who consumed the food on Monday. 
Now, the four allegedly suffered stomach aches in the evening of Monday and were subsequently admitted to the hospital. This led to the Food and Drugs Authority to shut down the watch joint located at Columbia, a suburb of Takradi, yesterday to allow experts to conduct the needed investigations to ascertain the cause of the alleged food poisoning claims. So I don't think I'll purchase watch here and the next one I'll be told that Sally is food poison. Then we are like watch here. <laughs> I mean, uh, clear. this is a clear example of making sure that national decisions mm -hmm. have like effects or, or yes. decisions taken at um, the, the uh, let me say national decisions have an effect all over the country. I mean, we're quite to call the Morocco case. Exactly. And we are expecting that whatsoever decision that the FDA took on Morocco will be replicated I in think different the parts. Uh, the MMDAs have a role to play this because uh, definitely. they are supposed to issue li uh, is it a, a, a license or something to you I mean, ensuring that you work within a serene in this environment country, in this country, you cook as hygienic. In this country, you are very good at regulations. Mm. Let's, let's, no, nobody can tell me otherwise. It's the enforcement of some of these regulations as where the problem lies. Mm. So I really hope this is an aberration mm. and a small um, bump in, in our long way to ensure that hygiene is, is the main yeah. focal it's point main in our, focal. our service delivery. So we will we'll just hope and pray that FDA will get to the latter of this particular problem because a lot of us are watching lovers, you know. <laughs> uh, still to come on uh, CNR Extra. The Ghana Health Services and backing on a campaign to vaccinate all children under five years to control the outbreak of polio virus in Ghana. Stay with us, we'll be back with more. We are grateful for staying with us on CNR Extra. You can join us with your thoughts and contributions on 0505858832. Let's take some of your comments. And this is coming from Kingsley. He says that, guys, go on um, all the search out. This is a wicked thing, and the perpetrators must be brought to book immediately. I think he's talking about the Okra Kojo incident, incident where yeah. two teenagers uh, were found dead. And also, um, someone is disagreeing. He says that from the same Kingsley, he says, I disagree with the journalist guest, although I understand that the tone of his suggestion, construction must be uh, done or take place in an area where it wouldn't disturb anyone. Construction must take place um, in a surrounding where uh, I think I'm going to take place in a surrounding that is uninterrupted by a high number of people, predominantly due to health and safety reasons. I suggest they develop an alternative makeshift structure that is a hospital made of containers and also other useful utilities um, that is good enough to accommodate people and manage a continuous service while the construction continues uninterrupted. Are you talking about the Lajena Hospital? Yeah, that's his opinion. Yes. I mean. but, but I think that in any case, the, the construction has to go on so that individuals there who assess health care. Exactly. Let's move straight to another story where the Ghana Health Service is embarking on a campaign to vaccinate all children under five years to control the outbreak of polio virus in Ghana. Let's bring you more in this video. The Ghana Health Service says it has intensified efforts at controlling the outbreak of polio in Ghana. This comes on the back of a detection of a new strain of polio virus called circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2. This was revealed at the launch of the national immunization campaign by the Ghana Health Service in Accra on Wednesday. The campaign will see to the vaccination of all newly born babies and children less than five years. There is more in the following report filed by Emmanuel Opong and read by Akusia Otre. As part of response measures to kick out polio, a national immunization campaign has been launched, delivering the keynote address on behalf of the Minister of Health. A deputy health minister, Mahama Saisini, says government, in partnership with stakeholders, is committed to fight against polio to prevent an outbreak. I'm delighted to inform this August gathering that is a new tool on the block of on the block to fight polio and Ghana together with partners will deploy the novel oral polio virus 2 version during the campaign. The Ministry of Health 
in cooperation with the Global Polo Eradication Initiative Partners, will organize two rounds of vaccination campaign against polio for children who are less than five years with the NOPV2 as follows. The first round, first to 4th September 2022. So mothers who have children or babies that fall within this age bracket should coordinate or collaborate with the uh, Ghana Health Service mm. so that this immunization exercise will go on smoothly. I mean, the fight against polio is far from over. Mm -hmm. We understand, according to UNICEF, that the United Nations International Children Emergency Fund, that another strain, that's the type 2, is around. But uh, um, we understand also that this uh, or polio happens in areas where there are poor sanitary conditions and also where there are a lot of unimmunized children. Mm -hmm. So we want to call on the Ghana Health Service. Um, they should take it up. They've been doing a fantastic job with regards to um, past um, 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 past instances, exercises, yeah. e exactly, similar exercises. So we'll call on them to still continue on that drive and help with uh, the eradication. But I mean, sanitary, poor sanitary conditions yeah. is one of the major ways some of um, polio thrives. So mm. then again, Operation Clear Your Frontage will we'll, come, we'll, we'll come back to them again. And also other um, statutory bodies that are supposed to be enforcing hygiene in our various communities. We want to plead with them to um, step up their game a little bit so we can ensure that we are able to fight some of these outbreaks as we come. Oh. Okay, so this is how we end today's edition of CNR Extra on City TV. I did this with Jude Mesa Duncan. So Thanks for coming. Thank and uh, stay with us on City TV as we bring you more programs. Keep watching City TV. My name is Philip Nielate.